Hey, Lem listeners, I'm super pumped today to be joined with the one and only John Barrows. John, thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So if you guys are rolling in sales, then you must know John Barrows is producing some amazing content. So for those of you who haven't checked it, you can go on his website, Vuk from my team. We'll put the link in the comments. He's the CEO of GBay Sales and has provided sales training and consulting services to companies like Salesforce, Google, LinkedIn, Slack, Dropbox, and many others. I'm done with the name dropping now. <laughs> and we're going to get some really awesome advice. Uh, we've been actually like organizing and setting this up for about, I think, five months. So super exciting and happy mm -hmm. to have you here. Yeah, um, I'm going to be here. Man. We're, we're going to dive right in and uh, start talking, you know, about the, the different cadences. So, mm -hmm. you know, where, when you're doing your, your cold outreach, how yeah. exactly does your cadence look like? If you can basically walk us through like different steps, <clears throat> different uh, channel you're using. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's the, 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 the thing right now is in order to stand out, right? Because the noise is deafening right now. I mean, when everybody went home with COVID, there's some statistics, uh, I think HubSpot was following where emails went through the roof, right? Because now everybody's pipeline stopped and executives yeah. panicked and, and a lot of them increased the activity level, right? But the problem was, is with all that new volume, the response rates dropped through the floor. Phone, same thing, right? Phone pretty much here in the States dried up 100%. Like, because it wasn't that phone wasn't effective. It was that nobody had their office phone being directed to their cell phone, right? So it's not about one medium anymore. It's not about one email. It's not about one voicemail. It's not about social. It's about all of it. And it's about orchestrating that in a, in a story that, 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 has a narrative through it, right? And okay. aligns with different priorities. And so it doesn't all have to be personalized, right? People talk a lot about personalization. I think personalization is extremely important, but personalization without relevance doesn't work. Yeah. Because I get a lot of people sending me emails. Hey, John, I see you went to the University of Maryland, you know, <laughs> go Terps, right? And then they'll hard cut to some, hey, we got this yeah. software development tool that has nothing to do yeah. with what I need. So if I had a choice, between personalization and relevance, I would choose relevance all day long. And so how do I mix that? This is the question. So the, the mix, <clears throat> you know, there's studies out there that talk about the optimal cadence, right? I think Sales Loft has some data that says 15 touches in 16 business days, whatever. But I think it really has to do with your ideal customer profile and your personas. Yeah. And the mediums and the weight that you put on each one depends because yeah. For instance, you know, I sell to VPs of sales in the SaaS industry. Most of them are in San Francisco. <clears throat> I can be very aggressive with VPs of sales in the SaaS industry because that's what they want their teams to be. Now, if I'm calling into Paris, into an HR department of a manufacturing firm, I probably have <laughs> to back off different. a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. Same thing like LinkedIn. I, I have the benefit of most of my audience is very active on LinkedIn. Some people... LinkedIn isn't even a thing for them. So that wouldn't make sense. So what I, the, the recommendation I have for everybody is you have to have a contact strategy, right? Whether it's six touches, 10 touches, 15 touches, whatever. But you want to tell the story all at the same time. So what I do is I pick five accounts, like tier one accounts once yep. a month. Okay. I'm going to talk about volume too later on, but once Can a you month. Just maybe like, uh, cause maybe some of our audience is not really like familiar with uh, the different tiers. So in your own words, if okay. you could explain quickly, like tier one, tier two, tier three. Sure. Yeah. And I, and actually this is what I don't think. I don't think enough people spend enough time on the yeah. ideal customer profile. And I think now, right now, more than ever is a time you have to do this because most of us get given our territories based on very basic demographic information, right? Industry, size, number of employees, revenue. Yeah. And we get our list and there's our patch and we start just one all the way through. There are certain client, there are certain prospects in there that are better than others. So what I do is I try to find all what I would consider tier one characteristics. There's certain industries that are better for us than others, okay? Uh, certain size of departments. So for instance, say you sell into a, an HR department. Well, is it one person who's juggling a million different things or is it a department of five people that all have different roles? Your value is going to be different to, based on that. What, te what type of technologies do they use, right? Are there technologies that are really good for you to sink into versus others? 
Who's the competition in there? There are certain competitors, you know, you have a great story to tell. There's others that you don't. So you want to get as detailed as possible with the information so that you can profile them and put them into tier one, tier two, tier three. Great average crap. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that dictates your contact strategy. The, the tier ones, those are the ones are going to do a very tailored, thoughtful contact strategy to mm -hmm. the tier twos. That's where I'm going to increase volume, but I'm going to do it in a targeted way. I'm not going to blast out a million emails. I'm going to do it based on a persona. Yeah. So you're a VP of sales in the SaaS industry that uses salesforce.com. Okay. I can come up with five or six different messages that speak to VPs of sales in the SaaS industry that use Salesforce because my value proposition to them is different than my value proposition is to a VP of sales in the manufacturing industry that uses Microsoft Dynamics. Yeah. So two different ways. One is when I sit down and I go after your account, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do all my research on your account, not you yet. Okay. Yeah. Your account. I'm going to look at your news and events. I'm going to look at, and I'm looking for triggers, open up a new office, launch a new product, merger and acquisition, those type of things that I can make a connection to. So I can say something like, Hey, you know, I saw your recent acquisition of XYZ, you know, I wanted to reach out to you because our solution actually supports companies who are going through mergers and acquisitions and whatever, okay. right? Okay. So three or four of those I usually find. Then I go to your LinkedIn profile and I see if I can make, figure out anything that's going on there as far as your background or those type of things. So and basically then, just sorry to interrupt, you will have like two levels, one level on the account. So yep. events, merger acquisition, anything in the news, et cetera, find a trigger and then mm -hmm. go on a more personal level where you can hook with the person. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and what's your persona and what are yeah. you being held responsible for? Okay. Okay. Now that I have that information and I probably have three or four different things that I can make connections to the business and a few things that I understand about your persona. Now I take a step back and figure out what's the story I'm going to tell. Mm -hmm. like what's going to be my first touch, second touch, third touch, fourth touch, fifth touch, which ones are going to be emails and calls? Where am I going to introduce social? Okay. Yeah. Now I do that very tailored for some very specific accounts, right? Where I go on your LinkedIn profile, I connect with you. I might even send you a LinkedIn video and LinkedIn video. If you're not doing it right now, LinkedIn video is the highest response rate that we get right now. Nice. Um, so that's part of our cadence. Um, so that's a very, but I only do that for a very select group, right? Now the tier two is where I get volume is when I pick some type of commonality, which is why it's so important to-, just, to... Sorry to interrupt again. <laughs> I just want to get as much as I can from you. So yep. basically, you know, when you're saying like uh, tier one and videos, uh, mm -hmm. would you use like a tool like uh, Loom or Vidyard to record yep. on the person profile, LinkedIn profile? And, uh, uh, so yeah. with LinkedIn though, you, you don't, so Vidyard, yeah, it's a great tool and it's yeah. free. So you can actually do that if you want to. Uh -huh. I really like the LinkedIn video that you can do through LinkedIn without oh, okay. any tools. It's okay. Totally so it's free. just your face and talking yep. to the person. Okay. Now, face, the, iPhone. Yeah. the trick with it is you have to be one connected. So okay. I can't yeah. do this to a secondary or tertiary and I have to do it on my phone. I can't do it on my laptop. Yeah. Okay, makes but sense. But if you and I are connected, when I send you a message, there's a button yeah. that's a plus and it drops yeah. down, video pops up. I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? That type of thing. So yeah. And what do you, what would you typically say? Like, would you get also the same triggers that you're doing for an email or would you do some a different <coughs> approach? Well, this is why that story is so important. Yeah. Because if I can take a step back and figure out what my story is in first touch, second touch, third touch, fourth touch, then I can think about, okay, where does video fall into this? Mm -hmm. And what okay. am I going to say on that video? Now, I don't recommend using video as your first outreach because it's kind of weird. It's kind of yeah. creepy to, and by the way, I don't trust what's behind that thumbnail. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I've never seen you before, the likelihood of me clicking on that to see a video <laughs> of you, not high. So what you want to do is what we do now is we kind of follow you on social, connect with, you know, like maybe reach, share or comment on something you did, then connect with you. Then I'll go on your website, do some research and send you an email. Then I'll make a phone call. Then I'll go back on LinkedIn and I'll say, Hey, Julian, um, you know, uh, you know, I've been trying to reach out to you for a while now. You know, the reason I'm actually reaching out is because you recently posted something about X, Y, Z. And I wanted to see if you'd be open to a brief conversation about some of the work we're doing with other companies in your space that are really aligned with that. So if you could email me back here or just hit me back on LinkedIn, I'd appreciate it. Right. Something okay. like that. Yeah. Awesome. But it has to be a reason. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, because I have that. So now it's like a LinkedIn, you know, connecting with you on social, whatever it is, then an email on a phone and then a video. Now phone, the way I'm using phone right now is we used to lead with it, right? Because people were picking up the phones. Now nobody is. 
So now we still use phone and we still leave voicemails, but it's for a different purpose. It used to be to, to get a call back, yeah. right? So I'd be like, hey, call me back, whatever. Now, because nobody's getting their phone forwarded to their cell phone and they only check their voicemails once a week, maybe. Now, when I leave you a voicemail, it's to get to go point you back to something else I did. Okay. So it's, hey, Julian, you know, the reason I'm calling is, you know, about two days ago, actually Tuesday at three o'clock, I sent you this LinkedIn, a, a video on LinkedIn, and this is what it was about. Could you do me a favor? Just go check that out and see if it's something worth talking about. Right. By the way, this is John Barrows, JB sales. Give me a call back. You know, that type of thing. Okay. And so, have you, have you tried like uh, giving like, cause right now you're mentioning something specific and also giving context. Have mm -hmm. you tried just to, to do this, but uh, just to trigger like curiosity and just say, I just recorded a video. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but I would love to get your take on it. It's on LinkedIn and that's it. Just, you know, like to kind of push them a bit harder. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, and you can test that, you know what I mean? Yeah. You can tell them what it's about, or you could leave it as a little bit ambiguous to say, no, go look. Right. Cause now I'm curious. Right. Yeah. Awesome. And that's what I'm trying to get you to do. I'm just, look, we ran two cadences, um, same exact persona, same exact approach, emails, calls, email, call, social, whatever. Yeah. This one, we left voicemails. This one we called, but didn't leave voicemails. Okay. We got a 13% higher open uh, response rate on nice. this one. So the reason to leave voicemails is not to expect a callback. It's to, because your email responses will go up. No, that's awesome. Do you automate voicemail or do you do that? No, uh, no? you just, I don't automate or... anything. Actually. Okay. I personally don't, okay. I don't believe in automated aut automation. I'm also not being asked to do 50 dials a day, hundred, you know, hundred activities a day. So I get it. Um, when you want to do automation, this is how you do it. You, you go persona driven. Yeah. So remember I said earlier about the IC ideal customer profile and getting the, yeah. all the details. So you can go into whatever CRM you have Salesforce or whatever, and you can run a report on some type of commonality. So I want to see all VPs of sales in the SaaS industry that use salesforce.com under 50 million. Mm -hmm. That might only be a list of 50 or 60 people. Okay. But now that persona I can now go do research. What I'm going to do is I'm going to literally Google VPs of sales, SaaS industry, priorities, challenges, 2020, COVID-19. Yeah. And see what comes up, right? Nice. What's the most yeah. recent articles on what these people, what that mm. persona cares about. Now I'm going to extract what those priorities and challenges are. Yeah. And then I'm going to tie my solution to those priorities and challenges one at a time. Okay. That's cool. Right. So now my first email to you is going to be like, if you're a VP of sales, my first one's going to be about keeping your reps motivated and engaged now that they're working from home. My next email might be to share a piece of content or a really good case study with you or something like that. That's somebody similar to you. My next call might be <clears throat> um, asking you a question that's very pointed to your persona and say, hey, the reason I ask is because. Right. And I can do that to 50 people at a time. Definitely. I can send out that one email. And here's a tip for everybody. What we're doing here is to get volume because we kind of go with the old school AIDA format of uh, like Glenn Glary, Glenn Ross, whatever this, it's the four mental stages we all need to go through before we buy something. First, something needs to get our attention. Then we have to be interested. Then we have to have a desire. Then we have to move to act. So if you look at emails, the subject line gets my attention. Yeah. The first sentence tells me whether or not I'm interested and what am I interested in? And by the way, this is for everybody. I don't care where you're listening in from. There's a universal truth in sales and human behavior here. The number one thing on the planet that everybody loves talking about themselves. True. <laughs> so when you start your emails off with, I'd like to introduce myself to you. Nobody yeah, cares. Not going to work. <laughs> We're the leading provider of shut up. Uh, recent surveys say none of that works. <laughs> you got to lead with them. Right? Yeah. So how do you do that? Well, you personalize it. Hey, I was on your website, but that takes time. Or you can ask a question. Mm. Hey, uh, Julia, how, how are you currently keeping your reps motivated and engaged now that they're working from home? The reason I ask is because VPs of sales, whose main priority is da, 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 leverage our solution this way, I thought it might be worth a conversation. And I can send that out to 50 VPs of sales if I yeah, want to. Yeah, definitely. Something I'd like to add also, not sure if you're uh, familiar with it, uh, but it's, uh, it's basically, you know, like uh, in order to find on your persona, what are their main priorities, what's uh, expected from them, et cetera. What's good to do is um, go either on Indeed or LinkedIn jobs yep. and check for like job, job offers and, yep. and job description because you Absolutely. can find like really what people are looking for specific to an industry. And it's actually great, uh, as you mentioned. Oh, absolutely. Things, but, I think that's yeah. a data point that gives me the, the general kind of roles and responsibilities of that person. Yeah. What I really want to do though today 
is find out how they've changed. Yeah, with the context, yeah. Right? So that's yeah. why, like, yes, okay, cool. But let me read us some stuff, maybe read a few blogs about yeah. what VPs of sales right now in COVID times are doing. So you marry those two together and now yeah. you can be relevant. Yeah, definitely. Right? <laughs> that's the point. Definitely. And in terms of uh, intro lines, because you were mentioning, you know, like I totally agree. So you have your subject line and then you have yeah. the intro lines. Do you have like um, any example of, um, of intro lines that, uh, that you usually work quite, uh, quite good? Ah, uh, they change all the time. You mean subject okay. lines? Uh, not subject lines, more intro lines, you know, because oh, oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> how do you start your email essentially? Because for example, what I like to do is uh, do like pattern interrupt. So instead yep. of saying with like, hey, first name, et cetera, is to, for example, start like, uh, I was checking your website first name and then put something because, you know, it's different from it's everyone different. else. And yeah. 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 So, you know, there's the cold outreach and then there's the response type of stuff. I think mirroring is big when it comes mm. to responding. So if my first email usually do is, Hey, Julian, da, 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 yeah. or hi, whatever. Uh, but then if you respond to me without saying, hi, John, and you go right into it, now okay. I'm going to mirror yeah. what that you do. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, there is a pattern interrupt to that. The way the, my most successful kind of intros are either based on my research of you. So, Hey, I, I saw your recent quote in CRN magazine, or I read about that. Or like I said, asking a question. So how are you keeping your reps motivated and engaged, right? Because the goal there is I want to get you, again, interest, right? Yeah. I got to get you to be interest, interest, interested enough to open the email and read the rest of it. So that's why I'm going to ask you a question that's going to get you to pause and think for a second and go, huh? Mm. <laughs> why are you asking me that question? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, an in, like, that's an interesting question. That's a question that I... Don't let, you know, it's based on my persona, my challenges, those type of things, or at least, you know, you, that you think. And if you can get me to think now you have, you have a potential of getting me to respond. And your question, is it like, uh, always linked to your value proposition yes. or do you find yes. something that's different no. question can work? No, it's really only, uh, okay. it's, well, it, it's cause you don't want to do the bait and switch. It's kind of like yeah. subject lines. You don't want to put something in the subject line. That's just to get and them then to they're open and then it's like, yeah. Right. Cause people sniff that out. Yeah. Definitely. And so if you ask like this, this interesting question, but have no tie to it again, might be personalized, not relevant. Right. Mm, so it's yeah. gotta be relevant. So why are you asking me that question? And by the way, tip for everybody out there, if you ever want to figure out whether you have a good question or not, whether it's prospecting or qualification, just pretend every single time you ask that question, the person you're asking that question to is going to push back on you and say, why do you need to know that? So you better have a reason for your question. If you don't yeah. have a reason, a good reason for your question that is in kind of their best interest in a lot of ways, don't ask the question. Yeah, I love it. That's cool. <laughs> I'll tell that to my sales rep. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm, I'm also curious because we talk a little bit uh, about the different icebreakers, you know, when, uh, mm -hmm. so you're checking like news. Um, can we go through maybe like uh, a few actionable and specific example, for example, uh, I don't know, news, then company updates, then, I mean, different different type of things that you would check and then the type of, uh, of icebreaker you would use. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be different for everybody because you got to figure out what are the, like, let's talk about the company first. Like you got to figure yeah. out what triggers are most relevant to your business, right? Mm. I mean, you can, I use a tool like, uh, I mean, everybody can use Google alerts, but there's a tool that I use here in the States and it's pretty good in OMEA too, is uh, Owler, O-W-L-E-R. Oh, okay, yeah. And so what Owler is, is it's basically Google alerts on steroids and I can follow, so I can take my top 25 accounts, I can put them on Owler, I can follow them on very specific things. So merger and acquisition, open up a new office, product launch, those type of things. So I can get alerts when that stuff happens. Um, but yeah, I tend to look for leadership changes, obviously. Um, but leadership changes, not because it's a new leader. Leadership changes because I want to see who that leader is and do I have any experience with them? Because okay. right now people are not really open to making kind of risky decisions with vendors that they don't know. So yeah. if I can figure out that you've had some type of experience with me in the past, I'm going to have an, I'm going to have an angle there. Um, you know, if you are, you know, for me launching new products, right? Because that, that means you need messaging to get those products out to the marketplace. And I can help with that. If you're expanding your, your uh, you know, if you're opening up new offices or expanding your operations, that type of thing, I can make connections to those. So I think you just have to figure out what, triggers are most relevant 
to your business and then kind of focus on five or six of them. Because what you can do is you can actually create messaging around those triggers that you can repurpose. Yeah. So for instance, every time somebody goes through a merger and acquisition, you can kind of say the same thing. Every time somebody launches a new product, you can kind of say the same thing, right? So you can actually create like merger and acquisition template that reads, hi, Sarah, I saw your recent acquisition of, that's the part you customize. The reason that prompted me to reach out to you is because a lot of our clients who go through mergers and acquisitions love our solution this way, blah, 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 right? So I would, you know, I would look at the first place I always go on a website is to the press releases. Okay. So usually if you scroll to the bottom of the website, there's a, a news, right? And, it, and there's usually in the news and press releases. Yeah. I like press releases because press releases are what they're saying. This is what we're doing, right? So I kind of comb through those. And I look for any quotation marks. If you can ever find a quote from somebody, that's the highest response rate I still get, <laughs> right? So if I could say, hey, I, I read your recent post or interview mm. where you said, quote, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Wanted to see if I could have the conversation you. The second best response I get is when I can use an executive quote to go after somebody else. Mm, okay. So I could say, hey, uh, I've been keeping myself updated on your business. I noticed where your CEO recently said, quote, boom. Uh, and I okay. want to see if I could talk to you about it because there's some impact there, right? Yeah, I love that one because actually you see a lot of um, more and more on LinkedIn, actually, you see like CEOs trying to to post, mm -hmm. you know, and get a bit more views. So I guess like it's a perfect thing, like because oh. sometimes that's, uh, that's kind of the, the trick, you know, for smaller companies. You don't have obviously always a lot of press, even though they can be like uh, doing millions and have the yeah. budget, you know, for your solution. But yeah, again, like I think it's, uh, is there any tips, you know, like uh, when you're after like smaller companies that have don't, that don't really have like a mm -hmm. press release, like how would you go for it? That's where you go persona. Don't okay. kill yourself on the research, right? You shouldn't, I mean, look, if it was up to me, I'd have a half an hour to do research on every single person I sent an email to. Yeah. It's just not reality, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. so if you go to a website and you realize that there is nothing there, then, then default to, to instead of personalization and relevance, which would, Hey, I saw this and let's talk now just go relevance. You're a VP of sales in the SaaS industry. I'm going to ask you questions that VPs of sales in the SaaS industry, get them to think. And I'm going to put together a cadence that can go out to 30 or 40 of them at a time. And ideally you do, you do persona in an industry. So VPs of sales in SaaS, right? Because you can get focused on that or VPs of sales in manufacturing because that's different. So that's, if, if I'm selling to the SMB space, I got to do volume. Um, so I'm going to do volume, but in a targeted way, not, you know, spending a ton of time. Now I will say there are always, I'm going to recommend everybody, I don't care what your territory is, have a list of minimum top 10. And those top 10 might not be huge companies, but they're the logos in those industries okay. yeah. that will make a difference. Because if mm. you get them, then the rest of your life is going to be a lot easier to fish in those polls because you're going to be able to actually use them as a reference. Awesome. Uh, actually, we, we're having quite a lot of questions from the audience. Just a sure. reminder for everyone who joined us, make sure to ask us in the, in the comments all your questions. Uh, so at the first question, I think it's quite interesting. So it's regarding lead qualification because we talked a little bit early on about tiers. So tier one being the one that are bringing you the most money, tier three, the one that are not bringing as much money. Uh, we were basically, uh, John, you were mentioning trying to automate everything that's uh, lower tier. So tier two, mm -hmm. tier three. And the question is, how do you know where to focus and not to waste time on the lower tiers? Um, well, first of all, it's not about how much money uh, from a qualification. It's, it's about the, the fit from a customer standpoint, you know yeah. what I mean? Where I can add the most value to them. And that's what I'm searching for, but you know, not wasting time. I, I think this is where you have to test, right? So, you know, somebody asked me recently, John, now that you're 44, <laughs> if you can go back and tell your 22 year old self something, what would it be? Right. My number one answer to that was a B split test, everything. Right. Okay. And I mean this across the board. So say you're calling into CFOs and financial services. Well, come up with two different messages that speak to CFOs and financial services, make 20 phone calls with this approach, make 20 phone calls with that approach, see which one yields a higher response rate. Right. When it comes to cadences, what I would do is I would, I, I personally, this is what I split quality and quantity. So I, there's a select group of clients that I am very deep on and I go and I come up with these very tailored content. It's usually about five a month. And I spend the first two hours the first business day of every month that's blocked off on my calendar to go deep on those. And then in the afternoon that day, I pick one persona and, and, per, and create a persona driven cadence and send out, you know, 50 to a hundred, you know, cadences at a time. So yeah. I'm doing quality here and quantity here. 
and then I'm testing. Okay. Right. To see, okay, am I getting a higher response rate on my volume? If that's the case, or if I'm getting even a close response rate, right? I'm doing volume because why do all the research if the yeah, response if rates are not that different? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think it's all about testing uh, to see where you're wasting your time. And if you're wasting your time, the problem that I see a lot of reps do is they all do the activities, 50 dials, all that other stuff, but they mm. don't really pay attention to those activities and what's working and what's not working. And I, and I'm really imploring everybody right now to be a, uh, to be a scientist, to be a scientist when it comes to selling right now, because if you are not looking at data and making adjustments and becoming agile in your sales process, you're, you're, you're a dinosaur and you're going to get run over because look, what worked three months ago is not working anymore. So you have to be constantly testing and, and trying and figuring out where your audience is now, right? Because look, people are broken down into one of three categories. You can tear them out one, two, three, or you can look at them as red, yellow, green. Red, those are people who are still in world of hurt and they might not even make it out of this. You know what I mean? Okay. So don't even bother. Then there's the yellow, which are the companies have kind of settled into the situation. They might not be making very many long-term decisions, but they're evaluating solutions. They're trying to tighten up things and they've kind of settled into this new norm. And then there's the green, which is the ones who are like, go, right? And that's either they going because all of a sudden they became hot, like Zoom. You know what I mean? Zoom all of a sudden popped from, oh, that's kind of cool too. Yeah. Holy shit, I have to have that. <laughs> Um, or green like me, where I got to get after it. Like, I don't have 50 million in the bank right now to sit on this and wait to see what happens. Yeah. Like I got to sell my way through this. So what mm -hmm. I'm looking for is that new ideal customer profile. I'm trying to find where those greens are. And you could do that by dissecting any deal that comes in right now. If you, if you close it, if you, anybody in your company is closing a deal right now, the first thing that I would do is I would get that AE up on a zoom like this. And I would say, where did that deal come from? What was the use case? What were the objections? Why did they buy this? All that stuff, right? Yeah. So you can profile and look for other companies that fit that profile so that you can understand where you're going to waste your time or not. Right. Cause there are just certain companies that might've been great for us six months ago. They're just not right now. Okay. And it doesn't mean they're bad in general. It's just right now you should not be focusing your time on them. Yeah. That's awesome. I really like that advice about, you know, like uh, taking your existing deals, trying to understand mm -hmm. if there are not other companies that are exactly the same and just go after them and, uh, and try to, to get them. Yes. To um, so there is another question from the, from the audience. So it's, it's more basically like uh, when you're on the meetings. So let's yep. say like you did your outreach, you're on the meeting and how do you ev how would you evaluate that a lead, for example, is worse like the hustle versus another one. So we know that sometimes it takes quite a long time, you know, like to close a deal, especially if we're talking like enterprise or large, large mm -hmm. size. How exactly would you, is there like any a set of questions that you're asking mm -hmm. or this type of things? Like how, how, what's your process about that? Yeah. I mean, the sale lives and dies in discovery. Uh, yeah. If you don't do the right discovery, you know, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to get stuck with no decision. You're going to get stuck yeah. with dragging through. You're going to get stuck with resetting prioritize. So I think everything uh, we need to focus on is in that discovery call. And so the prep for that is really critical. The questions I ask are critical. I don't come in with generic questions like tell me about your business or okay. tell me about your priorities or any of that stuff. Um, I look for impact. Right. So I've been playing around a lot with like what I call impact questions, okay. right? which is, you know, it's, it's a little different than ROI. Like ROI is okay. Let me take all these numbers, put them into a sheet and give you a number that you're not going to believe. But impact is like, why are we, why are we even having this conversation? Why are you looking to make this type of thing? And by the way, what, how, how does this align with your growth goals and projections and what your executive said? Because look, if at the end of the day, people talk about creating urgency, I'm sorry, as sales reps, you can't. Yeah. You can't create urgency. Stop trying. I mean, you can manufacture it with like discounting and stuff like that, but that's just sad. Yeah. It doesn't um, work. <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It, Long, it, it works, but it's short term mindset. Yeah. Well, it's also just pathetic. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, it, literally like, it, like you, by the way, just for everybody listening, if you've done your job and, and I probably, and, and I've told you, yes, we're going to go with you, but you know, probably next month or something like that. And I get an email on Friday, the last day of the next of the previous month that says, Hey John, I know we said we we're going to move forward, but if I give you 10% now, you've ruined, you've ruined all credibility. Yeah. You've lost all rapport. You've turned into the gross sales rep that I really didn't want to deal with. And now you just ruin the experience. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, you can't man, you can manufacture it, but what you can do with urgency is you can uncover it and you can drive it. And the way you do that is look, I've always been a priority based seller. 
All right. I've always fundamentally understood when your CEO stood up in the beginning of the year and said, these are the things that I got to do to be successful this year. If I can't tie my solution to one or two of those, good luck closing anything of significance. Right. Yeah. So I got to figure out what those are. Now, unfortunately, the way I used to get there was by saying dumb stuff, like tell me about your priorities. Right. Yeah. And with a very generic approach like that, I used to get very generic answers. Oh, revenue. It's like, yeah. Okay, let me show you <laughs> how it can impact your revenue. Great. Right. Yeah. But now I, I walk in and I say, you know, I do my prep. I do my research on you. I have a checklist that I go through before any meeting. What's going on? News and events. Sim similar to prospecting. News and okay. events. What's happening in your business? What are you? LinkedIn profile. Those type of things. And I ask questions around, hey, when your CEO stood up in the beginning of the year, what were those three initiatives and how is what we're talking about there, how does it align? And what are you gonna measure? And, and, and what's the impact of this to those, right? Because if you can't find real impact, good luck. I mean, you, you gotta be able to figure out the business impact of that problem. And here's a great question uh, that I always ask from an impact standpoint, uh, and I recommend everybody ask it uh, at the end of their initial call. So say you had a good discovery call and there's some next steps, right? And they told you what the timeline was. Like you, they want to make a decision or they want to roll this out by January 1st, yeah. right? Ask this question. Great, January 1st. Cool. So we can reverse timeline this and go from there. But just out of curiosity, what happens if you don't roll this out in January? Okay. What happens if you don't do it? Ask that question. That'll dictate your forecast. Because there's either a real answer to that, which is, if we don't do it, we're going to miss out on this and we're going to, you know, miss deadlines, whatever that is. And there's real business impact there. Yeah. Or there's a, well, you know, I just kind of, just kind of keep doing what we're doing. Nice. Okay. And if you get that answer, you either A, not talking to the right person or B, I would not forecast that opportunity. <laughs> no, that's, ah, that's, that's actually super interesting. I love it because it's, uh, it actually allows you to, to really understand what the, what the consequences of, of yeah. not having this to happen. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's really great because I guess in that case they're not gonna say well we're gonna decrease revenue and give you like very standard uh, answers you know. <laughs> well, here's what you can do with it. You can then if you've done the right discovery and then you say so say it's like oh yeah we have to do this and you know I'll give you an example. I made a mistake a while back when I was qualifying an account. <clears throat> I qualified and I understood what the pain was. The pain was discounting. So we were talking about negotiation training, right? So I, oh, discounting, that's the problem. Cool. Let me dive in to show you how I could, I could address discounting. The problem was though, I didn't figure out what the impact of that problem was. So yeah. for instance, all I had to do was in the woman's name was Amy. All I had to do is say, okay, discounting. That's why you guys are looking at, okay, what, well, what's your average discount rate right now? Oh, 20%. Oh, okay. What, what's your net new revenue target for this year? hundred million. I just found a $20 million problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so now later on, when yeah. you push back on me and I'm telling you, I'm going to charge you $200,000 for training to fix that problem. And you're like, oh man, John, that's super expensive. I don't know, or whatever. We're going to have to push this until maybe Q1. I can be like, I'm a little confused Yeah. And I, in a genuine way, not like a sleazy sales rep way, but in a genuine way, like we had talked earlier where you said, the discounting was the big issue. You, it was a 20% average and you got a hundred million net new. So I, that, I mean, I'm doing dumb math here and I'm just at a back of napkin math here. It looks like that's a $20 million problem that you have. And you're telling me that $200,000 to fix a $20 million problem is too expensive. Either a, you don't believe that my solution can fix that problem. And if that's the case, let's have that conversation or B I'm missing something. What is it? Yeah, that's nice. And I actually that's send nice. emails, yeah. by the way, with the subject line that read, what am I missing? <laughs> like if you ghost me after one yeah. of those conversations and I document that, I'll forward that back to you. And I'll be like, what am I missing? You and I talked about all this stuff. This is what you said your needs were. I haven't heard back from you. Either A, you don't believe that I can do it or B, I'm missing something. What is it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's really cool. And um, someone's asking actually from the audience um, regarding, you know, like, because uh, you mentioned that obviously with uh, the COVID, everything likes changing. You have uh, really like some companies that are killing it, others that are not. Is there anything that uh, you've decided to kill or remove from the process and where things you've seen, uh, apart maybe from the LinkedIn videos, et cetera, like any specific things that you've stopped doing and other thing that you started that and where you showed that uh, it was working really well? Uh, 
I wouldn't say stopped. I'd say, you know, focused more on- Or decreased, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like like phone used to be a pretty solid piece. Yeah. Now I use it as a reinforcer. Uh, the LinkedIn video stuff definitely is something we're doubling down on. You know, email is always part of the equation. Um, yeah, nothing that I've stopped. I mean, I've stopped focusing on. I, I've I've stopped focusing on clients that really are not even close to in the situation to be, be able to buy from our stuff. So I okay. I have reset the ICP. I have reset all our priorities and who we're going after. But I really haven't. I haven't removed anything that you know. I'm always testing things out. So I guess okay. the micro stuff I'm removing as far as like <laughs> a phrase here or a phrase there. But as far as the general communication, no. Um, I will say things that don't work as much anymore that used to, you know, like using funding to reach out to somebody. I don't yeah. use that anymore. Overused. <laughs> yeah. Cause everybody uses it. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, hey, no, no, I, true. Bunch of money. Right. yeah. <laughs> um, I, what I do use funding for though, is to let you know, I'm paying attention. So yeah. for instance, it's my touching base and checking in. Right. So I hate those two phrases. They're the two most meaningless phrases in sales. Um, you always want to have a reason for reaching out. Yeah. And so when I'm touching base and checking in with you, what I want to do is I want to see what's going on. So I use awards and funding to let you know I'm paying attention. Mm. So what I might say is, Hey, Julian, Hey, congrats on that funding. Hopefully that means something good for you personally and professionally. Yeah. And that's nice. it. Yeah. 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 Not let's talk, not let me sell mm. you something. Uh, I also, I'm a big Gary Vaynerchuk fan here. He's here in the States. He's kind of crazy, uh, but he's got that book, jab, 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 right hook, which is effectively add value, add value, add value, then ask. Mm. Uh, I've been taking a page out of that over the past few years of, of trying to figure out how I can add value to you without always asking yeah. uh, some other small nuances uh, and gong just came out with this data, which is fantastic. Um, so if anybody's listening, gong.io slash blog is the best blog I'll ever read in my life. Uh, they have this, uh, they had this data on calls to action in COVID time. And there's three calls to action, three types of calls to action. One is a very direct, are you free tomorrow at three o'clock? The other is a little bit more open-ended. Hey, when are you free for a call? And then the third is more of an interest call to action, which is, hey, is that something of interest to you? Are you already using something like that? Let me know. So it's a little bit softer. Yeah. Now, I've always been a pretty hardcore direct call to action guy. I've always said, if you want something, ask for it. Yeah. But data says now that actually the interest CTA is far more effective. And so now it's like when I tell you I got that story. I'm trying to, it's almost like this one way conversation, right? So I'm trying to have this one, Hey, is that something of interest? Hey, check this out. What do you think about that? And what about this? And all I'm trying to do is get you engaged, not necessarily ask for your time, but get you to engage in some way, shape or form, and then go ahead and ask. So I'm, I'm doing a little bit more of that these days. No, that's really, yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, like uh, I've always been like, uh, from our data, maybe it differs a bit like uh, email versus uh, calls, et cetera. But from our data, like the the, um, the more direct the ask is in the call to action with less possibility. So some people would say free next week, would you be free next week? This doesn't really work, but if you yeah. give them like two options, like Tuesday, 2 PM, mm -hmm. Thursday, 4 mm -hmm. PM, usually it works like much better, but uh, that's interesting now, also to add the, yeah. So it's data, it's actually flipped now. So yeah. when you're prospecting, because everybody's time right now is so valuable. So you asking for it is kind of like, mm, Mm -hmm. Let me make the choice here, right? So that's why, hey, yeah. is that something I've mentioned you, John? Now, it's the exact opposite when you're in the middle of a sales cycle. So yeah. again, according to Gong, if you and I are like, we had our qualification call and we're trying to schedule next steps, then yeah. you want to say tomorrow, three o'clock, that type of stuff. But when you're prospecting, try it's almost be a little softer right now. Try to yeah. hey, is that something of interest? Are you already using something like that type of stuff? No, that's that's really cool. And uh, you mentioned early on, you know, like uh, a bit, uh, you touched based on the follow ups. Um, yeah. From me, I think like a lot of sales rep are are doing follow up the wrong way. I'm talking, you know, like uh, let's say you have your first meeting. Yeah. So, do you have like a very specific structure for your follow ups? Uh, and if yes, can you share with us like uh, some very like specific example of the thing you say, the thing you never mentioned, the thing you do, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, you can actually Google this one. If you go, if you Google Jay Barrow's favorite nugget, you'll see it. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> I, I, it's my favorite nugget. So nice. <clears throat> I call it the summary email. Uh, so the way it works is this. Um, and, and you, so first and foremost, you have to let them know this is coming, right? If you don't let yeah. them know this is coming, the response rates drop through the floor. Um, I know a lot of reps who summarize the conversation and just send it to the client. The key is getting a response back. So what you do is, hey, thanks so much for your time. Some next steps and action items here. 
Before I go ahead and do all that though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly summarize what I was able to gain from our conversation today. I'm going to send it over to you in a quick email. Could you do me a favor and email me back to let me know if it's all accurate and if I missed anything? So okay. you got to let them know it's coming. Now, right after you get off that phone, don't write a book here, okay? This is not a chance for you to reiterate your value proposition. This is purely to confirm what you heard from them. Current situations, this, timelines, this, priorities are this. Timeline and priorities are the ones I try to dig into and impact of those. Yeah. Um, Would you reuse like what you've learned? So for example, if the person told you, you know, you mentioned like January 1st, we need uh, X, Y, Z, or yep. if this doesn't happen, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so you will mention the for... consequences of, of the, um, yep. if it doesn't happen. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So timeline, okay. you want to roll it out by January 1st. If you don't roll it out by January 1st, you were telling me that this is a, you know, okay. the, the impact of that is this, because what I want to do and next steps, you're going to do this. I'm going to do that. Now I'm going to tell everybody right now who's, who's listening, <clears throat> send that. I only get, even when I tell them it's coming, I still only get about a 30% response rate. But I'll tell you right now, the response rate to that email will dictate your forecast accuracy because mm. I only get a 30% response rate, but I have a 90% close with that 30%. Yeah. The 70% <laughs> that I don't get a response rate on, I have about a 35% close ratio. Now, 35 is actually not that bad. 90 is way better because it shows there's engagement. It shows there, yep, that's accurate. And by the way, above the power line, below the power line, people who make decisions and people who don't. What you find, what I find is that people above the power line actually have no problem responding to that email. Hey, yep. Yeah. And, and I might even leave gaps. I made, hey, I forgot to ask you this. Could you fill that in? Because A, executives know lying is a waste of time. And B, you just did their job for them. I mean, when's the last time an executive took notes during one of your meetings? It doesn't happen, right? So you do that. Now, people below the power line, they have a problem responding to that email. Not that they're lying to us. It's just that they know their lives change so often that they don't want to commit to anything in writing. So right there, it's going to tell you where you stand with that. And then you have now, when you have that response, now you have something to hold them accountable. And now what you do is every follow-up meeting, you use that to say, Hey, is this stuff still accurate? Yeah. Here's another tip for everybody. Question. The, the, the very first question you should ask on every single one of your meetings after your first one. So you've done a first qualification discovery, whatever it is, your secondary, tertiary, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. Ask this question. What's changed since our last conversation? And it could be a nice little small talk thing, right? So as everybody's getting situated and we like, say, hey, just out of curiosity, before we get started here, you know, what's changed since our last, not has anything changed, not yeah. yes or no, but what's changed, assume that something has, yeah. what's changed since our last conversation? You ask that question, you'd be amazed at what people tell you today because things are changing daily. And then what you say is, okay, now, so does that impact all any of this stuff that we had talked about last time, your priorities and those type of things? No, okay, cool, then summarize that and keep going. Yeah, that's dope. I love it. It's uh, that's interesting because I think like uh, the way you ask the question is really, really important. Oh yeah. Because as you said, like uh, if you ask like, has anything changed? People would feel uncomfortable saying like, yes, mm -hmm. there are like a few like. Whereas if you'd say, yeah, what has changed? You know, it's what's uh, changed. Yeah. Things are changing daily right now. What's changed in your life, in your business, and the priorities, right? No, that's uh, that's really cool. It's um, the same thing with uh, by the way, small nuance there too is like when you're doing a presentation. What you, when you're doing a presentation to a client or whatever, you don't ever, as you're doing the presentation, you don't want to say, do you have any questions? That's a very accusatory, hey, idiot, do you have any questions? Yeah. Instead, you say, what questions do you have? Yeah. Okay. What questions do you have? That's, that's letting you know. This is the part of the conversation. People yeah, have questions. You need to ask a question. <laughs> right. Do you is, hey, idiot, do you have any questions? So yeah. just that small shift makes a difference. No, that's uh, yeah, really interesting. Um, if we go back a little bit to the to the cold call, you mentioned that right now it's a bit less effective, but due to, to the situation. But whenever you're doing cold calls, um, how does that go exactly? Like, because I'm I'm guessing you don't start with cold call. You usually do that after a few emails. So do you try to reput the context in your cadence? Like, how how exactly does that work? It re again, it, it goes back to what's the story I'm trying to tell them, right? Yeah. Sometimes I use phone to reinforce, like I'll do the double tap where I'll yeah. send them an email and then I'll call them and say, hey, you know, the reason I'm calling is because, you know, I just sent you an email. It's Tuesday at three o'clock. This is what it's about, you know, call or email me back. Or if I want to use phone as a separate touch, right? Yeah. So I do the email, email, then a call. If that call, I want to have a separate reason, right? So it, it's the narrative I'm trying to tell here. And so a few tips on, on calls. Um, my, my favorite introduction, and I believe everybody should 
use this because this gets touching base and checking in out of your vocabulary is to start every single call with the phrase, the reason for my call is. Mm, okay. Because if you cannot finish that sentence, you should not be making the phone call, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, hey, the reason for my call today was on your website. knows you guys are doing some really interesting things. And I wanted to talk to you about how you're actually doing blah, blah, blah. The reason for my call today is we're working with VPs of sales in the SaaS industry whose main priority is this. Thought it might be worth a conversation. The reason for my call, okay? Yeah. So I usually, um, my flow with intros, like if it's a cold call and you pick up, it usually, you, you brought up pattern interrupt. It used to be, Hey, this is John Barrows, JB sales. How are you doing today? Right. And that's <laughs> almost like this Pavlov dog, like, yeah. okay, sales rep, how do I get off this phone? So I've switched that and I say, Hey, thanks for taking my call. Do you got a couple of minutes? Mm -hmm. And I usually get, well, not really, but who is this? What do you want? And you just, by doing that, you just gave me permission to talk. Yeah. And then I get to, well, this is John. Thanks. You know, I appreciate it. This is John Barrows, JB sales. And the reason I'm calling is because, and I move right into the reason for my call. Now that's a live call. Uh, phone, uh, voicemail, I actually flip it over. Um, we don't leave our voicemails. We don't leave our contact information at the beginning. We leave it at the end. So we yeah. say, we don't say, hi, this is John Barrows with JB sales, blah, blah, blah. Because if they listen to the voicemail and that's a big, if they'll probably gonna, it right yeah, after yeah, that. Yeah. So we start with, Hi, this is John. Uh, hi, the reason for my hi, Sarah. The reason for my call today is we're working with other VPs of enablement. Blah 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 blah. Mm. I was just wondering if you could call me back. My number six one seven five two nine seven two seven one. By the way, this is John Barrows with JB Sales six one seven five two nine seven two seven one. Because it's, it's a pattern interrupt, right? Every yeah. voicemail sounds exactly the same. So I want to break that pattern. See if I can get him to pay attention to me. No, that's nice. And regarding the the call calls, do you actually like follow a script? Or mm -hmm. is it something you're more like, uh, you're doing more like uh, I think go? it's important if you're starting your career or if you're starting in a new job, I, as much as I hate scripts, I think they're important to get the flow down. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is where we're going to go back to tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier three is I used to throw my tier threes away because I'm like, you're bad customers anyways. I don't <laughs> want you, right? But now I love them for one very specific reason and it's practice. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rip a list because who cares? As long as I don't say anything offensive, I can kind of do whatever I want to do here, right? Yeah. So I will write out a script. Hey, the reason for my call today is blah, 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 right? Um, I like structure a little bit more so I can play with the structure. I can kind of tweak my intro. I can tweak the intro, uh, the reason for my call. I can tweak the call to action. But in general, I want to get that flow down so I can say it enough times where then I can internalize it and then not have to use the script. Right. Because if I have the structure of the different categories of how do you introduce yourself? What's the reason for your call? What's your call to action? Now I can kind of plug and play. But for the first few times, I got to kind of write it all out so I can do it. This is why, by the way, your value proposition has to be super short. Like you're, 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 when you say the reason for my call today is that has to be less than 15 seconds. Yeah. Definitely. And I'll prove it. And I, anybody listening here, I guarantee this has happened to you. You ever been halfway through your pitch and you're boring yourself? <laughs> You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, if somebody yeah. says, what do you do, John? And you're like halfway through it and you're like, oh my God, this sucks, but I got to keep powering through. Cause you know that I guarantee you that's around 12 to 15 seconds. So you got to get to the point yeah. where you're like, the reason for my call today is boom. Right. Yeah. It has to be like super simple and sharp. Yep. Yeah. Very true. Uh, I know your time is valuable. So we're going to go with uh, the last question from the, from the audience. So um, for you, does it make sense to include the offer during the call sequence or do you think it's too soon? Because, you know, we see a lot of people like um, trying to go to go kind of like straight for the sale within the, the email. Uh, what's your take on that? You're not selling when you're prospecting. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll take that back. You're not, you're not selling your solution when prospecting. Yeah. You're selling the next step. You're selling mm -hmm. time. So no, I don't think you, and by the way, you have no idea about me. So don't make any assumptions about what you can do to help me. What you might be able to do is talk to me about what you've done to help other people like me. Right. But don't say, John, like try to remove stuff from your vocabulary. This is like, I think we could really help. I believe we could, I don't give a shit what you believe. And I don't <laughs> give a shit what you think. Now, midway through the sales process, after you've discovered, uncovered my needs, then I care what you think. Then I care. But early on, dude, you don't know me. Right. So don't you dare tell me I got a solution. I mean, I'll, unless you're selling something that's a super commoditized thing, that's a yeah. one call close type of stuff that's whatever. Okay. Um, but no, I, I would, I would avoid trying to sell your solution. I would, I would more try to bring value and get them to think a little bit so that they want to talk to you about your solution and, and are curious. And that's why AIDA, right? Attention, interest, desire, action. 
I'm just trying to get your attention and interest here, right? When prospecting so that I can then get you to be like, okay, tell me more about that, right? Because when I tell you what I do, my goal is to get you to go, how do you do that? Or tell me more, right? If I can get that, tell me more, how do you do that? Now I got you, right? But I'm not going to tell you all the wonderful things about my stuff when it's probably not, a, not relevant to you. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Like I see too many people trying to go straight for the sale, but they don't know you. They don't trust you. How would they buy from you? So yeah, thanks a lot, uh, John, for all these uh, amazing nuggets. Uh, to be honest, uh, we were like, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. Is there anything you want to say to the audience where they can reach out to you? What should they check, etc.? Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, just hit me up on, um, you could either hit me up on email, john, J-O-H-N at jbarrows.com. LinkedIn is where I put out all my new info. We do have a new on-demand platform uh, that has all our stuff in video format and it's 420 bucks a year. So for an individual sales reps, you can get literally the same exact training that I give to Salesforce and all those big companies. It's uh, if you go to jbarrows.com, you'll see training for individuals. You click on that, it'll bring you to a landing page. You'll see all the details. It's not just me, it's my colleagues, Morgan Ingram, James Buckley, all those guys as well. Um, and yeah, just, you know, just if there's, a, if there's anything we can do to help. Also, Instagram is probably actually, if you want a free consulting, uh, I do all my <laughs> consulting off of uh, Instagram. So if you have questions about sales and you want to meet a, like Instagram is the fastest way to get in touch with me. So it's John M as in Michael Barrows, B-A-R-R-O-W-S. That's my handle. Hit me up on Instagram and I'll happily answer any questions that you got. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Thanks a lot, John. And uh, have an amazing day. Take care, Thanks, guys. Talk soon. Right.